Yes, so last section. What we have to do is now to bring in the machine learning model and display the performance. And it's actually only Python code. So what I'm going to do here is, maybe I'll make this full screen, yes. Uh, what I'm going to do here is basically create a random forest regressor. And how I'm going to do it is, you know, the classics. So I'll just copy the paste, paste the code here. I'm creating a random regressor. I'm using the max depth that I get from the user. Same for the number of trees. I'll just change the number of estimators. And I'm getting the input feature. Uh, my output feature is set to be trip uh, distance. And I'm basically calculating the predictions. One other thing that I need is to import the scores and the random forest regressor here. That's done. And the last thing that I want is to display the performance of the model. So I created a whole different column for this and that's where I'm going to do it. So I'm going to say display column, subheader. Uh, what do I want? I probably want mean absolute error. Uh, the model is, I'm going to have like a explanation and another one. So I'm going to, what else would I, would I want? Um, mean squared error and maybe R squared score. R squared score of the model is blah, blah, blah. Okay. So what I want is to show them. So I'll show them in the display column. I'm going to say write mean absolute error give it the actual value and the prediction. Yes, so I'll do the same for the other ones. This is mean squared error and our square score. And let's see. So nice. So you can see here we have the mean absolute error of the model, mean squared error, mean squared error. error. Let's use the mean squared error of the model and R squared score of the model. Awesome. So let's see if this actually affects it. So I'm going to change the max depth and the values change to so another very obvious change. So maybe if I do something like this. Okay. Yeah, they are changing. So we see that there is some change happening. Uh, so maybe we can add a couple of things. So what I realize is that we are using the number of trees directly, but we're not really taking this into account. So the next thing you can do is to create an if condition here and say, uh, let's just do this after number of estimators. Then uh, maybe we'll, yeah, we'll do this here. So if the number of estimators is no limit, then I will not give a number of estimators, but otherwise I will give it the number of estimators that it wanted. Okay, so now this should work. Let it run again. If I say no limit. Yes, it's working, not, not giving me an error. Uh, one, another thing that we can do is that we're asking people to choose an input feature, but where they don't really know what are what the input features are. Oops. Uh, so what I can do is to show them a list of input features before they need to select an input feature. I will just going to say here right before this, going to display them after that. And yes, let's see. Okay. Now they can see all the name, uh, all the features here and select one. So, you know, you can say, I want to uh, see drop off location ID, press enter. And then I see different values. It's apparently not really good. What about trip distance? Hey, 
Hey, look at that. That one is very good, actually. This is awesome. So uh, last thing I want to show you is caching in Streamlit. So this data set is very small. So when I change something, things rerun from the beginning, but we don't really see much of a change here. So, you know, because the data is very small, we don't, there is not a big delay of loading. But if you don't use caching, what's going to happen is that every time you change something in this area, every time the user changes its selection, uh, the whole app, so starting from the beginning, is going to run again. And if your data set is very big, the data set that you're loading is very big, what's going to happen is that your app is going to hold for a long time before it can do other things because it's going to be loading the data set over and over again every time there's a chance to change. So uh, Streamlit actually has a solution for that and that is caching. So let me show you how to do that. So first I need to put the code that I only want to run once in a uh, function. So I'll say def get data and the data getting is here. Nope, it's here. I'll just get this whole thing and I'm saying okay this only I only want this to run once so I'm saying return taxi data and instead of this here I'll change it to get data so I mean you can use this function for to get other data sets too so maybe we'll say okay I also want to give the name of the data set here so I know which data set I want to call uh, and then we'll say file name so you can use the same function for other things okay so so far we haven't done caching yet we just put the code that we were doing here instead of a function and we're calling the function when we want to get the data how we want to do how we can do caching is pretty simple all you have to say is at at and say streamlit.cache, that's all. So from now on, as long as the file name doesn't change, as long as the file name that you're giving to the function doesn't change, this function is not going to run again. Streamlit is going to save the result of this action, of this function somewhere, and when you call it again, it's not going to perform the action, it's just going to send you the saved version, the saved output automatically. And that's why we will not have to wait every time the user changes an input in the program, so. Let's see, everything still looks as expected. And uh, I don't know if we're going to realize a difference here, but this is just a yeah, model running. Uh, yeah, you would, you would realize a big difference if your data set was big or if you had a very long um, application. And with that, I think we're ready to wrap up our project. The last thing I want to show you before we go into deployment of this app, so you know, putting this app somewhere on the internet so everyone can see, uh, is some customization. So there is not much built-in customization when it comes to stream streamlit apps. You know, the background is very white, uh, the font is very generic. It's a nice font, I mean, to be fair. Uh, but you know, you might want to personalize it a little bit. And as I said, there is not much of a built-in thing, but what you can do is this is a trick i found in the streamlet uh, community actually so here what i'm saying is i want to change my background color to a little bit of like a lighter white not really like a sheer white but you know a bit lighter um a bit softer rather so yeah you see the difference now you know there now you can tell the difference between the plot and the background so that's one thing you can also change the the font you can change the font size but i mean i like those and i don't want to change those but just keep in mind if you want to change something if you want to add some css this is the way to do it and uh, with that our project is actually done we have a nice title you have places where you can write some text you can you now know how to create some plots uh, I might make a video in the future showing you how to do some more interesting plots using Plotly, uh, plots that you can actually interact with. I mean, you can, as you can see, you can also interact with this. I think you can also zoom in and out as much as you want. But with Plotly apps, it's a little bit more flexible. So I might make a video in the coming weeks to show you that too. And yeah, with that, basically, we have a nice app in our hands and in the final video, I will show you how to deploy this app so other people can see it too. 
Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you liked the video, don't forget to give it a like and even maybe subscribe because I'm more or less here every week. I'm trying to bring you the content about becoming a data scientist. And don't forget to also go check out my website. So you want to be a data scientist.com. There I share weekly articles. I have a podcast where I interview other data scientists and data professionals, and I have free and paid resources. I have courses on data science, both for understanding where you want to go with data science and also getting practical hands-on experience on data science. I mean, that's actually the name of my course, hands-on data science. So go and check those out and I'll see you around.